we don't want to treat children as their blank slates as they're being There's boiled. no philosopher called Calvin Hobbes. That's the comic book. I didn't. You didn't read the comic book? Am I, is that just a generational thing? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Aaron, what's up? Hey! Nice to talk to you again. Nice to talk to you. So, where do you want to start off on? Let's make the list. You want to make the list? Topics. Okay. Uh, you pick one that you want to talk about. <sighs> Sam Harris's book. You're reading Sam Harris's book on I, morality. I am reading Sam Harris's book. Uh, I want to know. Landscape. I want to know how you determine good things from bad things before you read the book, and like how that book might be changing you now. That would be like a cool thing. Where um, else you want to go from there? Um. Let's go with. I guess you wanted to talk about how like we, kind of picked our top Marvel movies. Okay, MCU yeah. ranking. Yeah, you wanted to kind yeah. of hit on that. Okay. I, th I I actually believe that you can work with another person and, and come out with, at least with the people who are a part of that list, yeah. a good <sighs> tiered system of where you say, this movie, if we value this, this movie is actually better. Like a criteria. If we have a yeah. agreed upon criteria, If we have a agreed upon criteria higher. that we're judging each movie from, yes. we could probably set them in a very nice, sub, like, objective order. Absolutely. But you have to have an agreed upon criteria. And the, and it's cool to just watch people, like, work on, <laughs> work on that. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, uh, everything's recording. And then, do you want to do the racist movie where you inverse the races of the people? Like, how would that work? Uh... Or in yeah, general, let's talk about uh, what would have uh, the benefits of creating a white slavery movie. Because let me tell you something. Oh, we can talk about that. Yeah, I um, the white slavery movie. That's. I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it would be. Okay, and then let's see. Before the end of our lives, what is what's one last thing to like hammer out at? Um. I want to talk about the let's talk about the political landscape and how we approach discourse in it. Okay, political landscape and discourse. All right. So, first thing, morality. You heard you're reading Sam Harris's new or one of his books. Which book was it? Uh, it's called The Moral Landscape. The Moral Landscape. It's, uh, right. One of his middle area books. His first book was um, The End of Faith, mm. and then his last, his most recent book is Waking Up. Okay, yeah. And then this, uh, this book falls somewhere in the middle of that progress. Okay, so um, you're reading The Moral Landscape by Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. Where were you at morally beforehand? I guess by that I mean, like, just to make sure you're an agnostic atheist. Is that how you would recognize yourself? Yes. yes. Outspokenly? Uh, yeah. If somebody asked me, uh, what is my belief in God, I would say, I do not know whether or not God exists. Okay, agnostic. But I do not believe in a God. Sure. Uh, atheist then because I have not been given what I would deem proper evidence to completely convince myself 100% that there is a God this is also kind of rudimentary but like how do you define Gnosticism agnosticism like in explicit terms what uh, does that mean to you and what's atheism theism agnostic as I understand the definition is lacking evidence to know something oh really and then Gnosticism as I understand it is having having complete evidence to know something what was that first definition you gave me just so i make sure lacking evidence to believe lacking something. evidence to completely believe something what is that so what is that the definition for uh agnosticism so to be agnostic is to not know something because you lack the pro you lack enough evidence to completely believe it means you don't have enough conclusive evidence yeah. to come to a conclusion yeah. so your position is i don't know so your position basically is i don't know okay okay and then Gnosticism in my in, in simple terms is I know mm. and normally people when talking about Gnostic atheism would say I know that God does not exist yeah that's when you like a definitive a definitive no or don't know right is normally what like there are no gods I'm yeah. claiming that claim yeah what do you think a theist is compared to an atheist um up to you and I I think most theists mm. are probably Gnostic or agnostic theist. Agnostic theist is some, basically really? what faith is. Mm. Because you don't... People will tell we you... We kind of got ahead of ourselves. So like, what oh. is a theist? What's an atheist? Just real quick. For me, a theist is someone who believes in some sort of deist, sure. deity, god. Yeah. And then an atheist is someone who lacks a belief. 
Okay, than sure. God. Sure, sure, sure. Not someone that doesn't believe that God doesn't exist. Well, I also someone... don't believe in a God, but yeah, that's not because I say there is no God. I am a theist. I'm, a, I'm an agnostic I'm... atheist as yeah. well, and I would say like. I know these terms are really confusing, but it's good to hammer them out. Yeah. That way, if we'll mention them like 30 times in this conversation. When I, when I, because when I inform people I'm an atheist, they, yeah. they often ask me, so you believe there is no God? Yeah, that's And I it. say, no, I lack a belief in God. Theist believes in a God. Atheist does not believe in yeah. a God. Gnostic claims to know. Agnostic claims to not right. know. So, I am an agnostic atheist. Me too. I do not know if there is a God. I claim to not know because... And are you open to the idea of a God actually oh, yeah. existing? Okay. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm, I mean, you just need the evidence for it? I, yeah. Okay. I would have to... Uh, and If you got the evidence for it, would you change your position and become a theist? If I got evidence... If I got the re- evidence through the proper channels that I use to claim that I know things. Mm. Is it possible to be... For the same God claim, for the exact same God claim, mm-hmm. for that one singular God claim to be both an atheist and a theist? Uh, so this is where we get into that, like, woo-woo Jordan Peterson kind of oh, thing. Oh, okay. Where you don't necessarily <laughs> believe there is a God, but you act as if there that a God exists. That's what I would consider an atheistic theist. Because oh. <laughs> cause the terms are kind of contradictory. So, yeah, yeah. So like, it's like, Jordan I Peter- don't believe in a God, but I'll act as one exists. Do you dare me. call Jordan B. Peterson a an self-contradiction? I think a lot of the things he says is self-contradictory. I think so too. Anyway, so morally, and I think I think I, it, it, I think that's what makes a lot of his arguments hard to follow. So you don't believe in a god? Where do you get your morals from? Because a lot of people would say that without a god belief, you wouldn't be able to tell what a good action is from a right action. How did you do that before you read Sam Harris's book? And you're still reading the book. Yeah, I'm still reading the book. But like, where? How did you determine that even before? Um, that? Interestingly enough, I was raised inside Christianity. Okay, that that was how I grew up. Sure. Uh, so, the argument that I don't know if you've heard um, Ben Shapiro's argument is that a lot of people in the Western in Western civilization has have the morality that they do because they were they grew up in a Judeo Christian foundation. Okay. Um, although I think there is some validity to that argument, I will grant him that there was probably some Judeo Christian foundation along with a lot of. Greek philosophy that played into developing the West I would not 100% say that you have to have those things Mm -hmm. but it's hard to it's hard to say exactly where morality comes from for me without acknowledging the aspect that I was indeed raised in that kind of setting okay so I can't for I can't it's still part of your environment yeah I can't for say that your formative years yeah my formative years were not developed alongside those morale got it but that being said, a lot we we have uh, evolved a lot of the Christian morality. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, a lot of a lot of Christian texts and a lot of religious texts in general has a very strict view against homosexuality. Sure. And I, even at a young age, argued myself out of that out of the, adhering to that dogmatism of the religious text. What would you say if someone said that was your Holy Spirit talking to you? Like, like, I would say... The fact that you were able to come to a, what some people would argue, a more moral perspective Yeah, was by virtue of the latent God belief that you just were trying to deny in your life. I would say that... Like, if I come from a perspective that you need to have a God to have morals, Yeah, the fact that you came to the moral position was through an aspect of a spirit speaking to you. I would say it's very interesting that the spirit would speak to me now, mm. but not to the religious text writers at the time that they wrote the text. Mm. It seems... it Because when you read that text, it seems like a very dogmatic view of the times. Sure. It seems like the prevailing view of the times yeah. in that book. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think based on a lot of different human emotions throughout time, we have managed to argue ourselves out of that position through rationale. Okay. Um, a lot of these emotions are empathy. You have you logical rationale of like, why is that any different or worse than, you know, sexuality that I have. Sure. Uh, things such as... Sure. 
things such as the argument of like, I, did I really choose my sexuality and did did they really choose their sexuality? Right, is right, that right, anything right. to actually... Whether you choose it or not, like, yeah. why is it a big deal? Like, yeah, basically. is that anything to morally hold against somebody sure. was my view. And I was just like, I don't believe that it is. Okay, so why did you come to that decision? Like, what was the machinations in your mind that took place for you to determine this is wrong and this is right? I feel like it comes... I feel like a lot of morality is... Harsh... Partially decided through empathy. Okay. Because I feel like to... Hmm. To come to moral... That's nice. I think I like to come to a lot of moral things... the You have thoughts that run through your head of... If this was done to me... You have to have the ability that, to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Okay. And decide if this was done to me if the actions that are getting done to these people if the actions that are even said about these people or if the if the rights being upheld away from these people mm. if that were to happen to me mm. because of something I never chose or or maybe something did that I did choose either way but didn't have an effect on other people outside of my life mm. would I find that a fair and just thing to happen to me and it, would I deem that to be acceptable to happen to me and when I thought about these things in an honest way without without ever letting trying trying to keep as much bias from my religious past from coming in as possible sure I had to honestly level with myself if that was me if I were these people I would not agree that that is a correct and moral way to treat people so you're saying you determine it based on your sense of personal empathy. Do does your personal sense of empathy uh, is that an objective standard to determine right things from wrong things, or could your empathy actually lead you to determining something wrong or incorrect or like actually haphazardous for like I social think maybe systems? I think maybe empathy wouldn't be incorrect in the situation. So like. You would feel something bad for somebody, but I think they, they there's a saying, and we've all heard it. Sure. The, the the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of people do bad things because they felt empathetic sure. for, for people. Like, how about this? I'm thinking, um, my sense of empathy, if I was a slave master, is well, look, these guys were living in the swamp or whatever. Now they're on my property. I take good care of my property. They're learning jobs. They're learning values. They're learning English. I'm, while they are working for me as my property, they are at least having a, um, a life with potentially more American values that I value taking place in their lives. Like I can, I can twist, I can twist yeah. my sense of empathy to make to yes. justify slavery. So I guess I'm wondering if is that would you agree that's possible with empathy? Um or is there something different? I I do agree that's a possibility, but as the other part of empathy is you have to be honest with yourself. Okay. Uh I don't know many slave owners that would be honest with themselves that they would want to be treated the way that a lot of slaves were treated. I can tell you right now, if I was like the mo I can't say for certainly, but like the slave people slave masters even mm -hmm. from like antebellum times didn't look at slaves as people they were, I know they were I property know. yeah so in that case mm -hmm. like i'm still being empathetic to all the people i know i'm just not qualifying my slaves as people then in that point in time you have to you have to put yourselves in your shoes had you had the misfortune of being born into that situation of being just born a different skin color than you are now mm. would that be a just and fair treatment for somebody to do to you yeah based on nothing that you chose just sure. based on the arbitrariness of being born into this world into a situation you had no control over. is there a more objective standard to determine good things from bad th good things from bad things other than empathy or there is that probably the best? is okay um there's a lot of things that we don't know for sure and there's a lot of like objective truths that we don't know about yet mm -hmm. And I would argue that just because we don't know about them now doesn't mm. mean that we can't work to figure them out or work to better ways of getting to them. And I would say that, like, just as, just as like, the objective of good health 
Hmm. That we had, this is actually, if you want, this is actually an argument that Sam Harris makes in his book. Okay, okay, we, yeah, we're getting, we're getting to the area of, yeah. yes, there might be more objective methods, maybe reading about them might be a good way to, like, yeah. learn more and improve So, one of the things, I, okay. I, I, I'll throw this out, one of the things Sam Harris brings up in the moral landscape in his first, in the first section of it, hmm. when he's talking about how, like, morality. Sure. He says, we didn't, we don't, we didn't always have the objective standard of health that we do now. Okay. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't that objective standard out there. It, uh, we just explicitly, right? Explicit. Got it. Got it. It, it exists somewhere in the ether we, of truths to be discovered. Yeah, we implicitly know we value health. Yeah. But now we have it like codified. Yeah. Okay. And we, and over time, we developed a better objective standard hmm. moving towards what is the truth of what is good health or perfect health or whatever. So be it that you know, the objective standard, objective truth of good health will be. Okay. We are moving slowly towards that, but we we have, we develop better objective truths, or yes. objective standards yes. to uphold, to reach what is good health. Can I try to summarize that, or can I, just so I can catch up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it back, I mean. Yeah, we, no we didn't always explicitly say health is a good thing. We should make laws that maximize our appreciation for health, or the mm -hmm. foundation of health mm -hmm. that we benefit. Maybe not laws, but maybe like guidelines. Societal contracts. Societal guidelines Societal or contracts guidelines, that yeah, we yeah, live yeah. by yeah. to reach good health or to... Right. But now we have those and we're constantly improving them. And right. we can see that from like our desire to have like healthcare laws and like yeah. better fair wages or fair prices for medicine and stuff like that like we it's it's the reason why if you get the flu yes you wouldn't say to somebody i'm in good health because ah. somebody would look at you very awkwardly and be like but you have the flu no and you'd be like no but i'm in good health and right. people would be like and it's like we have laws or not rules the contradiction like, you have would the, play in your head because we've uh, we've developed the objective standard ah that like on a fundamental the, recognition yeah level. that having the flu is actually not what good health because now is. we know what the flu is yeah i see yeah, yeah so yeah. we've developed an objective standard that says flu not good health okay so we've i i get it so yeah good i'm glad we got that back and forth so basically you're saying before we didn't know so much what it looked like before we didn't explicitly recognize the status of what someone who's not well looks mm -hmm. like compared to someone who does now that we know what it looks like to be healthy and what it looks like to not be healthy now we can take any person and say is this person healthy because now mm -hmm. we have a frame of reference yep Got so it. now we've so what sam harris would probably recognize that is is moving the objective standard mm -hmm. forward but how do you interpret it because i know sam harris has a book and he says it but how are you is that your interpretation of it um or i would say it I would say something sort of along the same lines. It's a better, it's a better way of defining something that was originally hugely subjective. Sure. To better contain that definition, the subjectivity of right. it, into a more objective. Standard. I think it's always good to have a frame of reference and then have standards of okay, well, yeah, you're healthy, but are you in a capacity where you can maintain this status for yeah. a long period of time? Or are you doing things that are detrimental to your health that will be effective yeah. long term? Like we can, it's good to have frame of references for that for yeah. sure. But I guess I'm going back to like, if there's a guy who's doing something that we would both agree is bad, why are we in agreement that that thing is bad? Like, here's my other argument for uh, just coming back to empathy real quick. Mm -hmm. I develop empathy as I get older, mm -hmm. and it comes stronger and stronger as I get Through older. more experience. The empathy usually that I have at 10 is not happens. the empathy that I have at 30. Yeah. So, Which is usually why 10-year-olds do pretty awful right. stuff to people. And I would hope by the time I'm 60, my empathy is much more improved than it is where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that I'm better to make a good moral decision? I should only do it at a certain age? Like, no, as no, no. An, and if, See, that's where you would have... That's where you want the importance of older generations as they've learned to develop this empathy. To make and laws for us. This, not maybe make laws, but help younger generations have that guideline. Because mm. you don't want to... There, there's the blank slate theory. Yes, people. I know. They think that people start out as blank slates, and sure, sure, it's sure, been sure. highly proved that people don't always start out as blank slates. That there are other biological factors that play into. Calvin things. and Hobbes, the great philosopher, yeah. came up with that. The tiger. Yeah, yeah. they're great. Yeah. Uh, right. So we don't want to, we don't want to treat children as they're blank slates as they're being. There's born. no philosopher called Calvin Hobbes. That's the comic book. I didn't. You didn't read the comic book? Am I, is that just a generational thing? Yeah. Okay, it might man. Be. Dang. Sorry. 
this a good comic book? Have you read any comic books? Yeah. Okay, like I mean, like in the newspapers. Oh no. Funnies. Oh, no, sorry. You would love. You would love Calvin and Hobbes of all comic books. I read. Uh, you would love Calvin. I read Hobbes. Dilbert. Okay. Okay. Let's yeah, just yeah, I know. Sorry. Let's just continue. But, you would love. I'm but, gonna send you some links. You're gonna be amazed how much like this kid's me. Like, so, all right, go for so it. what I was so you would you would want to not approach people as though they're blank slates. Sure. And then you go back like you would have older generations trying to set up a betterment of guidelines. But I guess what I'm saying is, if you can make a decision based on empathy today. Knowing that your empathy will improve dramatically as you get older, how confident can you be in any of the decisions that you make morally if you're using a non-perfect system? Individually, probably not very confident. Mm. Wouldn't it be better to have a more objective system that's not based on how old you are? Yes. And I'm not saying that we couldn't create a better one. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying that... There are, there are many things that play into the aspect of morality. Got Empathy it. is probably one of them. There okay, are sure. Probably yeah. other things. Yeah. Like, for instance, yeah. having a point of reference is probably another good one. So let's make this let's make this morality right now. Let's say, hey, we both thought I could. I maybe I can slip in my my idea of what yeah. Sam Harris was saying. Maybe not, this is even Sam Harris's idea. It might be a, a slight combination of like the Dillahunty, Sam Harris, and a bunch of other people, but more or less like. Yeah. Also, some Emmanuel Kant in there too, but like, well, we'll uh, here's my here's my thing. We both value empathy. Mm-hmm. It's probably better to be empathy than be empathetic, treat other people empathetically than not treat other people empathetically. Yeah. there are exceptions, but we both value empathy when it comes to treating. As other long people. as you don't perver- as long as you don't like perverse empathy. Yeah, sure. That's, that's probably the goal there. So yeah, perverse empathy. And we also wouldn't want to use empath like empathy in a way where we start to deplete generally our sense of health because we value health over being sick yeah we also value life over being dead like there's a lot of lists rules yeah. of things that we can greet and like it's good to have frame of references for things it's nice to be able mm-hmm. to have the right to explore ideas and get a good frame of reference rather than not be able to explore ideas and get a good frame of reference mm-hmm. all those things wrap up into what i call the social contract the social contract is basically goodwill mm-hmm. or well-being. It comes oh, by a lot of different yeah. names based on whatever philosophy you're going for. But yeah. I value well-being and empathy, frame of references, asking questions, health, life, all that falls into it. So, so we'll put a pin in that. Put a pin, put, put put, a pin on that? What does it, that mean? It's just like, you know, like put a pin on a board, like pin. So we got well-being. Okay. Yeah? But what I was going to bring up is I think um, – a lot of the stuff that I kind of had melded into our morality yeah. comes from like different philosophers I've read as well. Sure, sure, sure. Same so here. one interesting philosopher is uh, John Rawls. Okay. John Rawls is the guy who came up with social justice. Warriors? No. Oh. No, no. This is the actual f- philosophical thing of social justice. Walk me through it. So John Rawls says that you want to try to develop laws in the real world as though you were developing them in some pre-existing area oh. where you can't see the traits that you're going to be born with. You can't oh, tell yes, yes. what situation in the world you're going to be born with. I know this. So you try to make laws as fair and just as possible. Because you don't know where you're going to Because you up. don't know who you're going to end what up What would at. that society look like and what kind of laws would that society make up if you don't know what body If you don't born know in. the traits yeah. you're going to be and born with. And it tends to be and the ones that, that promote the everybody. I- and that is the idea of what social justice would be. And I like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, I think... There's a guy named Immanuel Kant. He's like this German philosopher. Mm-hmm. Kant? Uh, yeah, basically. He's basically saying, like, if I'm going to make up a rule that guides my actions, I'm going to imagine that everyone else is going to also act on that same rule mm-hmm. as well. And what would the world look like as a result of that? So, like, yeah. if I wanted to just, you know, do something horrendous like steal something, mm-hmm. if I said, well, it's okay for me to steal this, then everyone's going to be able to think it's okay for me to steal this. Then we have a world where everybody thinks it's okay so to steal things. So in the world things. of law, that's normally called precedence. Yeah. When you set precedence for something, mm. usually it means that somebody else can refer to that precedence right. that you've set and mm-hmm. can come back and do the same thing to you. I think in both in the case of Rawlings, Kant, and your empathy, it's the action of taking yourself out of a situation and seeing how it would affect the general public. Mm-hmm. And I think even Without with, knowing... With without setting it in such terms that it can, you want to set it in such arbitrary terms that you don't rule anyone out, right? Because you don't know Correct. whether or not you could have been somebody that would have been. You don't want there that. to be special pleading in the rule. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, 
going back to that pin, well-being is basically just an agreement that we fundamentally agree that certain things are more valuable than other things. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we can make up objective rules to support this well-being. Yeah. And if we do that, what we'll end up with is a society that's better off than people who don't make rules to support well-being. Yes. So like, if we value not getting murdered compared to getting murdered, we should make a law that says don't get murdered. We should come up with a punitive list of things that will happen to you if you do murder. And this is our social contract. Mm -hmm. And people who murder will, will refer to the, song, the contract and be like, no, you get put in a box. Or you get put to death if we agree to that. Mm -hmm. But like... That is what we all agreed on. And the societies that don't come up with those kinds of rules that says you can murder anyone you want won't live as long compared to the ones that come up with the, well, yeah. the social contract. We'll have some sort of objective truth that we know about the morality that we're living by. We have a... We have tests. We, we have tests. It's basically what you're running is a giant moral test. Kind of. It's like more or less like we have some subjective things that we like, but we can also come up with objective rules to support those subjective mm -hmm. things that we like. And we can step out of ourselves and like do a model of our head of like, is this a good rule? Does this rule that we're coming up with support well-being or does it not support well-being? Yeah. And I think empathy and all the other things that you're mentioning fall into like the things that I value. I, I want people to behave empathetically. I want people to look up you know, philosophers and come up with better ideas to improve laws that we have that deal take how we interact with each other. Okay. I think that's all good. So yeah. now I will bring in a counter argument. Oh, go for it. Or well, actually let me let me finally state the last bit of Sam Harris's Go for it, go for it. So the basically the reason Sam Harris has stepped into this argument uh -huh. is the goal of the goal that I can get kind of from his perspective of why he's doing this is he wants to try to avoid two really big things that happen in the world that kind of make make morality very strange for the world okay first thing is he wants to try to avoid like not just religious dogmatism but dogmatism in general mm -hmm. so dogmatism being being things that you strictly adhere to that you might not have evidence or support for those being the best things but you're doing them he doesn't want people to talk out of their ass Basically, okay. he wants he wants good supporting rational, like evidence based logical reasons for why people are behaving the way they are. It sounds like he just wants people to have good reasons for the things that they believe. Yeah, got it. And evidence for the things that they know to base their reasoning off as much objective truth as possible. Okay, sure. Okay. And okay. then the other thing he wants to avoid, and I think many of people will. Uh, Maybe understand this as moral relativism. Okay. So let me give you a good example of what that is. I, okay, go for it. For the camera. Uh, for the camera. Yeah. I mean, I think you have a I might, I might, I might be educated. Go for it. Go for it. Moral relativism, as Sam Harris puts it, is we, we don't want to say that something in another system is moral just because it has existed in that system and that's just their sure. way of life. Yeah. And that we can't judge that on our own morals. Have system. you heard of cultural relativism? Yeah, that's it's the same, same thing. thing. Same thing. Yeah. So, for instance, we wouldn't think we in the West mm. wouldn't think female genital mutilation is a moral act. No. But it is something that goes on quite often in the Middle East, and it goes yes. on quite often in Sudan. And that doesn't make it a moral. And that good just thing. because, but there are people who will be apologists for it happening because sure. they'll be like, that's their culture, those are their morals, that's what they live by, and we can't judge them for that. Sure. Sam Harris and I, yeah. even before reading Sam Harris's book, firmly disagree with that. Right. Because if that is the way that we live in the world, mm -hmm. then what we're saying is moral codes are just whatever you're born into, and you can arbitrarily treat anybody the way you want sure. based on however you were born into the world. Yeah. And that causes a very chaotic, disastrous situation for the world because all you all it needs is one society born and thinking that murdering everyone in the world is the ultimate goal of their yeah. society. Yep, yep, yep. And people around the world are going to be like, that's not moral. You can't just murder everybody. And they're going to be like, no, no, it's our culture. And that's right, what do. right. And you can't respect and, that just because it's and the culture. You can't have people who, I think people who will be moral, moral relativist about that. I talk over there about all the young men and empowering them to make sure they exercise. Oh, yeah. Rights. Exercise is great. No. Oh, oh, exercise your rights. Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, serve. Yeah. So, I mean, people served before me. Good on you. So, oh, thank you for that. Yes, that's yes, who, thank you. That's who needs to be 